I want to talk about selecting for honey production. Mm -hmm. That one's, it's tougher, but go ahead. Um, Steve Tabor, who wrote uh, Breeding Super Bees. Yep. He's also got a book that was taken out of the Beekeepers Quarterly. Some of the articles that he wrote for the Beekeepers Quarterly, and I've read that as well. He's just fascinating. Sharp guy, yeah. Uh, fascinating to read. He he was sort of an antagonistic personality, yeah. I think. He yeah. enjoyed an argument. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. would argue with anybody about anything <laughs> and uh, just for loved sport, it. For yeah. sport, yeah. Just for fun. Yeah. But um, he was talking about a study done in Wisconsin. It may have been in the 1940s where they had a bunch of queen breeders that were supplying queens and they graded them for honey production. And there was one queen breeder that routinely just smashed everyone else on honey production. And they thought this guy, this guy got has genes. got, yeah. he's got some genes for honey production. Yeah. So they went and studied his operation and they found that his genetics were no different than everybody else's. Yeah. What was different was he did a much better job of rearing big, fat, healthy queens. queens. That's where it's at. That's why I, I, I figured that out early on too, that she's the cornerstone of the whole colony. Yeah. Not just how she was raised and how developed her ovaries are, which determines how big the colony can get, how many eggs she can lay, yeah. but she's also the sole genetic component there obviously what who she mated with but it's on her well Steve Tabor indicated that um, honey production was not a function of genetics it was yeah. a function of queen health and how they were raised I think so because everybody knows that big colonies are the ones that make all the honey yeah. little colonies aren't gonna do a whole lot so it's the most productive most well-developed queens that are gonna do that and not to mention there was another publication I read and uh, the guy was talking about breeding for honey production and how difficult it was to breed for that. And he was saying too that some of them are just super efficient robbers as well. Yo. So like oh, your really? neighbor is not making any honey and you're pulling out tons. Uh, you know what I hilarious. mean? Yeah, so it's it's hard to get a hold on that. You're just, you're just breeding for criminal behavior. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> criminal get, behavior. Don't get all the honey from right. your neighbor's hives. Yeah. <laughs> so hilarious. if you can sleep good at night and do that, more power to you. But I, I would have moral issues with it. Anyway, that, so, it is pretty funny though. Ta Tabor had an interesting point. And I've got to say, I may disagree with him after listening to a few things. Um, but he had an interesting point. He said, if you wanted to breed for honey production, you should breed bees that tolerate multiple queens. Interesting. And I don't know if anyone has ever done that. And I don't know if anybody could do that because the bees favor their own queen because they they're more closely related to her than they are to anyone else. But I've heard people mention too, like, I think it was... Uh, Sam Comfort maybe he like made an off-the-cuff observation that some of the VSH bees he had that survived really well routinely superseded their queen late season yeah and I, I think that's a you'll, thing you'll see you know? you know you'll see it fairly often I guess it's in a certain percentage of colonies they There's will supersede but they won't kill the old queen yeah they'll have the old queen and the new queen yep and both being viable and both laying yep so if colonies would do more of that not only is that a tremendous backup if one oh, of them yeah, dies. Somebody gets killed or sick. Yeah. You've got, say the old queen is at 40% efficacy. <laughs> but and she's at 100, yeah, you're at 140. Queen, you've got 140% queen lane. Yep. Um, I, I don't think he's wrong there. I, you may be able to select for that. That's a possibility. But either way, the logic holds up because the biggest colonies. Yeah. That's why I got obsessed with queen quality. Because if you read like Jim Doolittle's scientific queen rearing, he got obsessed about quality. Yeah. Because he was making emergency splits and selling mated queens. But he's like, those aren't the same as those. They're not as good. They're smaller. They're underdeveloped. They don't lay as well. Because if you get a, you know, how it works is an egg's laid, the egg hatches. So there's a t approximately 24 hour span to where there is no difference between that female larvae that's going to be a queen and that one that's going to be a worker. Yeah. At some point they feed them different and it's like an epigenetic change of their DNA completely changes them. So if they start eating worker mix and they're like, whoop, we need a queen, we'll start yeah. feeding you, she'll turn into a queen. 
but she's not she going to be, be the as, same queen. No, as she if does, they planned it from the start. Exactly, her ovarials aren't as developed because worker ovarials aren't very developed. They can lay in a laying worker scenario, but they're not like a fully functioning queen. So whenever you're grafting larvae, it, like the best rule is like if you can barely see it or can't see it, that's the one you want. <laughs> like as soon as they come out, get the smallest, absolute smallest larvae you can. So counterpoint to this argument mm -hmm. that honey production is a sole function of queen quality, not queen genetics. Uh, the interview that you did with the fellow at USDA, Baton Rouge, uh, and he was Garrett. talking about the, the yeah, Garrett uh, Dodds. Garrett Dodds, mm -hmm. that's it. Um, he was talking about the Hilo program in yeah. Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So they've got a queen breeder that's got a thousand hives and they push uh, VSH genetics into his operation yeah. because he can make queens year round exactly. and they want to have a really good VSH queen breeder that can yeah. has an isolated location yep. and will be a viable commercial source for VSH genetics. Exactly. So they push VSH into his operation and something happened and his honey production is about half what it should be. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so this tells me there is a genetic component because surely his queen rearing did not change. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. I would say it's a genetic component. Well, it may be. I, I know they started doing instrumental insemination and, and all this stuff. True. Uh, USDA worked with him, so it, his queen rearing had to change some. I don't know that it was his queen rearing. Environmental factors, for sure, and then it's got to be a genetic component, too. Yeah. You know, it may not have been, just may not have been as good a year. You yeah. know what I mean? Like that Who happened, knows? so it's hard to judge because this year was really good for us. Yeah. Where last year, and if I used a different line of bees now, you're inclined to go. Oh, that, that was, was the what bees. it was. It was those bees I got, yeah. but it may not have been. Or it may have been to some degree, and the other may have been environmental. You know, it's super complex. But I think, I don't think it's a hundred percent how the queen was raised, but that's a massive factor. There's a, also going to be a genetic component. I think it's both. So if you get really good, really uh, high quality queens that are raised properly and you got the genetics. Yeah that's where it's at you know honey production is a think about what it's a function of it's a function of bee flight mm -hmm. they go out looking for nectar they bring nectar back to the hive they have a certain number of bees that are drying it down and processing it and all this and more bees inside the hive makes that hive more efficient at gathering yep, nectar so exactly population Huge I think indicator. determines uh, honey production more than genetics because genetics yep. would indicate you could have a smaller hive but the bees work harder yeah that's a possibility and I don't know that that I don't know that that is true though bees seem yeah. to be workaholics no matter what right but genetically like Tom Seeley's bees genetically stay in one deep yeah these bees are genetically definitely not in a deep you know like I've got a super a third super cracked on one of those and there's bees all yeah. over the outside of it yeah. as an entrance so the whole thing's full of bees that's genetic you know, you know it's complicated <laughs> yeah another another factor is where you're at um, big time it, 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 Think about where Ian Stepler's at. Mm -hmm. I was in Alaska last year and it was light 23 hours a day, or tw it was about 20 when I was there. That's cool. So bees could fly and work 20 hours a day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, they, if they can, yeah, if it's they light will. outside, they will. They're working, yeah. So where Ian's at, he's probably got five hours more daylight than I do every day and he's got hundreds of acres thousands of acres blooming all at the same time so yeah. the bees have more opportunity to go out and gather nectar oh for sure so it, it's a function of flight population and environment and, and environment i don't yeah. i just don't know that you could breed for a harder working bee i don't, I don't know, know that you can yeah maybe maybe because i know there's some that'll fly at lower temperatures than others you know that yeah, exactly. might be a genetic like the, component like the german black bee yep exactly um, i know there was one question you asked me like what because I am technically treatment free, like what makes, allows me to be successful. Well, it, I mean, it goes right back to Tabor, high quality raised queens. Like I won't sacrifice quality 
you know like in a big double deep I'm only putting 40 graphs in those frames will hold 60 and they'll make 60 but it cuts the resources and the cells get smaller so if I have to sacrifice quality I'll back off once I get the quality I want then I'll scale that to get the quantity I need but really good raised queens selected for host and disease resistant genetics so a genetic component and then I'm okay at beekeeping so I know how to spot problems and I don't mess around if there's a problem like they get requeened or if it's a bigger colony and they're kind of dwindling because the queen's out I'll just drop a new nuke right in the center of it and then they're back in action and so being able to raise queens is massive and being able to raise high quality queens I think that it keeps me in the game the because you're going to lose bees queen failure or you'll make splits and you'll put some in and some of them don't make it you know that's yeah. kind of like an accordion now you can make a whole bunch but then circumstance or the environment's going to take some out and being able to expand and actually produce queens and produce nukes and stuff comes down to queen rearing so that that's where it's at